Hey guys! Hello! So, we're back in the US. We're very happy to be back, um, but we wanted to talk about some of the little tricks and tidbits that we learned from our time in Baja. We wanted to just dive in and sort of give our impressions of this area and um, things to be aware of. First thing we wanted to discuss was roads and the road conditions. <clears throat> Um, one of the main things that really bugged me about the roads is the narrowness. Um, highway 5 was great. Mm -hmm. but For the most part. Yeah. Yeah, Highway 1 was pretty dang narrow, and it, it was kind of scary trying to stay on the road and not go off the shoulder that dropped down. And passing semis. And there were a lot of semis on the road. Because these semis tended to hug the center line pretty Well, they close. just had to. I yeah, mean, there was they like, did. they took up the whole lane. One of the interesting things that the semis do on the highway is because it's hard to see around them, they will actually put on their left turn signal when it's clear for you to pass them. And, um, you know, we've never seen anything like that in the States. I think they might make some close calls on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but it was um, very helpful. It was We used helpful. it once or twice. The other thing is you kind of have to expect the unexpected. There were at least three situations where we were going highway speeds at least 45 or 50 miles an hour. And there were vehicles in our lane that were just at a complete stop. You know, maybe they had one orange cone like 20 feet away from them, but no warning. Yeah. One time it was two semis that were stopped just talking to each other. <laughs> so that was really wild that there's just like anything kind of goes down there, yeah. I feel like. But for all these reasons, it's really recommended not to drive after dark because... The semis are going to do what they need to do to stay on the lane, and you might get squeezed in your lane. The topes are going to be really hard to see if they're mm -hmm. not painted. Most of them actually were painted, but there were definitely some that weren't, mm -hmm. and the potholes and all those things. So best to just do all your driving during the daytime. Since I was working a lot while I was down there, we, we really needed to have cell phone service. We used um, the Telcel network which is, I guess, the main network in the area, which had really good 4G service when we were in range. A lot of times between cities, there, there were just blackout areas. San Felipe was great, Guerrero Negro was great, and Mulahe was great, but basically most places in between were questionable. So that's the thing to consider is a lot of these um, like beach boondocking spots that look so great on their surface, they're just not going to have any service, so you won't be able to do it if you need that. So I bought our SIM cards ahead of time from Amazon. It just came with a website to go to to activate it, and that worked. Um, we just used them in our cell phones. We just used them in our cell phones, and we were able to turn on the hotspot on the cell phone to broadcast that for our laptops. Mine ran out, and then I was able to re-up it using these uh, 15 peso, 2-hour unlimited... Um, plans. So if the SIM card runs out, it'll pop up a little notification on your phone. You tap the notification and you can select whatever plan you want to, to refresh the, the card. I will say that it, that process was pretty buggy. I was only able to do it a couple of times and then it just, just stopped working. Thankfully we had Maggie's card to fall back on. And then like 24 hours later it would work. Yeah, it would just work sometimes, sometimes it wouldn't work. It was super unreliable. Yeah. We did um, hear from others that you could go to the Telcel store to reactivate it. So some people might have concerns about safety and we don't really have a lot to offer other than we never felt unsafe. Um, sometimes we were traveling with friends. Um, our leg from San Felipe to Guerrero Negro was by ourselves. Although we did, when we got to Guerrero Negro, we knew some people. But yeah, I would just say follow the basic sort of guidelines that you would in any strange place or big city. You know, don't be out alone after dark, buddy system, um, you know, lock your valuables away. Yeah, most of the crimes that we had heard about were just crimes of opportunity. That's like, right. Like really obvious, leaving highly valuable things out to be... That anyone could yeah. just come and snatch it off the beach. Or yeah, whatever. we would put our ground deploy. We would lock that up at night. Yeah. Um, we did have someone in our escapers group in San Felipe have their gas can stolen off their truck at the grocery store parking lot. Just wanted to real quick touch on the different documents that we had with us in case um, 
that was a question you had. So of course we made sure to have up-to-date passports and there's always you know a window through which they need to be valid through. I think sometimes it's three months valid, sometimes it's six months until it expires. So just you know check what those rules are. We bought the FMM tourist visa which is required. Uh, you can just go online and buy that. So it's a form that you populate online and then you print it out and you'll sign it. And you'll also want to print your proof of payment because when you get to the international border, they're going to want to see your FMM visa and they're going to want to see your receipt. Otherwise, they're going to charge you again. You also need to have vehicle liability insurance, which includes um, your tow vehicle as well as some, anything that you're towing. There are lots of companies and they all offer different rates. So shop around. We ended up finding a good rate through Lewis & Lewis. So we had printed copies of that in case anyone needed to see it. And you just want to make sure your vehicle registration is handy. It used to be a little bit more difficult to bring a pet in. You had to get proof that you had seen a vet and the pet was healthy within like a week or so of Ten visiting. Um, that is no longer the case. It, we didn't actually have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But it's a good idea to have documentation that your pet has had rabies and everything. Yeah, we made sure we had um, the most recent records with us showing that all of his vaccines were up to date. There are restrictions on produce, grains, things like that that you can take across the border. Um, look into that online. Our experience was that that's not as big of a deal to them. We never had anything confiscated. So yeah. Um, they're we more did, interested in the, the more criminal yeah, stuff. Yeah, you're not allowed to take guns or ammo across the border. Yeah. You're certainly not allowed to take illegal drugs across the border. We did hear on the way back some people had some, um, was it pork? I don't remember. There was some meat product that um, the United States did not want them to bring back in. It was pork or beef, I can't remember. But we had no problem with um, any of the other you know, groceries that we had. They might have confiscated things and that would have been within their right, but they weren't, they didn't bother us with that. Regarding language, Brad had been studying for months using some different language lear learning programs and it was really beneficial. And so we would recommend that you brush up on your skills or you go down there with at least a basic knowledge of being able to communicate. There's definitely several military checkpoints that you're going to pass on these highways and basically what they're asking is where have you come from and where are you going and can we look in your rig or whatever and they're probably going to be pretty frustrated with you if you can't answer these very basic questions so just kind of knowing what those questions might sound like mm -hmm. um, will help you get through this process smoothly. Mm -hmm. I really like um, the Pimsler app uh, but I just highly recommend using any apps that speak to you out loud so you're listening to the language and learning to understand it and the pronunciation and they really focus on that that listening and the pronunciation and also you should always respond out loud and that helps you to learn how to speak it and when you're down there you'll find that it's rewarding and fun when you can communicate and and use the language yeah agreed it was it was fun <laughs> If you've never been to Mexico, um, you might not really know what to expect. And from some of our footage, you know, we kind of focus on the beautiful scenes and we're not really filming, you know, the litter or the abandoned buildings and the graffiti or whatever. You know, just try to take that in stride. The people are friendly, they're warm, they're welcoming, um, they rely on tourist dollars, they're happy that you're there and um, the places that are available and open are wonderful. So in San Felipe, we did have reservations at Victor's RV Park, and that was because we had gone down with the Escapers group and they sort of set that all up for us. I don't even know exactly what those sites are per night. Yeah, I don't know what they cost. That was a pretty decent park to stay at. An even better option might be uh, Club de Pesca, which is right next door to Victor's RV Park. We know that they offered $10 dry camping on the sand. But in all our other places that we stayed, we did not have reservations, and that was never a problem. 
That's right. You definitely want to have pesos to pay for these um, things because they'll they'll give you a little bit of an upcharge to pay in dollars or they won't accept dollars at all. So definitely make sure to have that on hand. But the prices were similar elsewhere that we went. In Mulehe, we paid $15 a night. That was for dry camping. For full hookups, it was $20 a night. Mm -hmm. And I think it was around 15 in Guerrero Negro. What was it in uh, Partecitos? 20. 20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so really cheap all throughout the peninsula. Okay, so um, groceries. There was one great ch grocery chain that we really liked. Cali Max, mm -hmm. it was called. Yeah, and that was in San Felipe. Um, and we were able to find pretty much everything we would want. Yeah, they were great. And the prices were good. It was definitely less money than we would spend in the United States. It, that was yeah. in San Felipe, but a lot of the towns that we visited did not have a Cali Max. And it was... A real slog trying to find the groceries that we needed. We had kind of heard that fresh produce might be harder to come by and the smaller the town the more that was the case. Um, if you can find you know uh, a roadside vendor you know farmer stand sort of thing that's great. Um, you just might not always know when they're going to be there. Uh, as far as fresh seafood goes, if you're in a coastal town, that's pretty easy to come by. You just look for a truck with a big sign. In San Felipe, we bought this big gallon bag. It was a kilo of shrimp, like the nice sort of jumbo shrimp. It was $14, uh -huh. and uh, it was delicious. It was fresh. It didn't smell fishy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very good. I think a few years ago it might have been hard to know if you were able to find ultra low sulfur diesel. It's what all diesel vehicles run on these days in the U.S. It's what you're going to find. Um, but we learned that all the Pemex stations down in Baja should be carrying it. And so, yeah, we never had an issue with that. And, and one tip, it's always recommended that you make sure the gas attendant, the fuel attendant, zeroes out the machine before they start filling your vehicle. And a and lot I, of times the attendants, they would point and, and show you that they had zeroed it out because there's yeah. just, I guess, some, some bad apples out there that will try to scam you and have money already on there and filling you up. So it's just, nice when they're honest about it. Yeah. Just, you know, stand out there while they fill it, kind of just keep an eye on things. All right. So weather in Baja was, as you might expect, Warm and nice, mm -hmm. lovely. Mulahe was around 80, 80s. It was warm. It was really beautiful. <laughs> yeah, in San Felipe, we were more in like the mid 60s Fahrenheit, and we did have quite a bit of wind there. Yeah. And we had quite a bit of wind on Gonzaga Bay. Oh, that's right. It definitely starts to get dramatically warmer the further south you go. And we can't wait to go back, you guys, because there's so much beyond Mulahe as you travel south. So all in all, um, really great experience, but we would have and should have crossed back at the Mexicali to, to come back to the States. When we came into Baja, we crossed at Mexicali too, but because of our trajectory uh, after Baja, we decided to cross at Los Algodones. Oh man, that was a mistake. Leading into uh, Los Algodones, there were some really potholy roads and we hit some of them hard and fast and the line <clears throat> for the border crossing just winds itself through this very small town barely enough room for a rig like ours let alone a giant class a and once you get to the very end to make that final turn into the border checkpoint it's really tight us being about 40 feet with our truck and trailer we barely made it. All right, guys, we hope this has been helpful. If you have any other questions for us, leave them in the comments below. We'll do our best to reply to you. And yeah, if you're thinking about going to Baja, give it a shot. It's beautiful. There's so much to see and do. And um, we had a great time. And we're definitely going back. Yeah, that's right. See you next week, guys. See ya.